Hey guys, uh, welcome to another video of Simple Haskell. Apologies for the um, delay between the video. Between the videos, I'm um, hoping to make this a lot more regular an occurrence. However, had a, quite a lot of time commitments um, over the past little bit. Um, so, and if you guys know how, Top Drill, I'm trying to get into Top Drill currently. Um, and yeah, so that, that's where my time has been. Had to spend a lot of time on Python and so had to rid my brain of issues, you know, Python, before coming back to this. And, um, yeah, so, you know, and unfortunately Haskell is not offered as a, one of the, one of the tests you could take the programming test with, unfortunately, but now I'll be able to use it for the next rounds of interviews. Um, so, excited for that. And, um, so now, um, this is kind of getting into a little bit more advanced Haskell, and this, and you know, simple Haskell. Talking about advanced Haskell, what's up with that? Um, and really, I mean, all of Haskell can be confusing to attack um, and, and figure out how to use it. Um, but the goal here is not to talk about simple things, but to simplify. Uh, challenging concepts and so I really hope that I've been able to do that for you guys in the past um, and you know continue to do that here um, so you know taking on now more advanced concepts which I would not say are at all important to getting started with Haskell like I'm definitely gonna make the last set of videos a sort of start here um, but now I plan to get into sort of like the libraries and the frameworks that exist in Haskell, make it really um, powerful to get started with, and um, more advanced concepts like concurrency. So uh, here we are. And so um, there's three different sort of things we need to talk about today. And the first one being IOREF, second being MVARs, uh, third one being TVARs. And so um, why do we need to talk about them? Um, well, all three of them are different ways of managing memory um, in the concurrency in Haskell. Uh, and maybe not even necessarily concurrency uh, with IO ref, um, but maybe just more complex IO operations. Um, and you can use it for concurrency. So, um, uh, and there is definitely the best of the three is the um, TVAR. Um, and so, like, you know, why are we why are we talking about all three of these? And and, and so, you know, I really see memory as a, an extension of the kind of core paradigms of, of functional programming. Um, you know, functional programming when you're writing it, you're almost like you, you can almost think about what you're doing in, in the sense of I don't care where this memory comes from. I just know that I have to provide this memory. Um, and so, I think it, it you know the way I see concurrency is just really. Uh, an extension about how we think about our variables. I could make a simple variable here, like let x equal 4, and I have a, a variable. Um, I have a value I can use, it has a certain type, etc. Um, but now the issue arises where we want to make really fast programs, and so we want to use concurrency to do so, so that we can split up the work to get the work done faster. Um, and some of that memory needs to be shared between these processes. So, um, again, many applications, not again, but there are many applications for concurrency. I'll let you fill in the blanks. I use it for web scraping um, and, uh, can, you know, controlling the web scrapers because I run, like, I've been running 16 web scrapers for the past um, two weeks. And, yeah. So, um lots of data there but yeah so let's start let's start um io ref and is io ref in this package i don't believe it is no so io ref and i don't know you know honestly not a much about this um because he er, sorry um my friend is sending me texts about uh fantasy football um, t -t -t distractions. So, anyways, IOREF. I don't. I've never actually used IOREF. Uh, I've seen it used for more complicated um, IO actions, um, but it's uh, it, it, it's not 
so it has the ability to cause blocking, um, in the sense that two processes trying to read the same I/O ref or work with the same I/O ref. You know, whether that be by um, taking the I/O ref or by um, you know by writing to it, there is a possibility for uh, error and runtime errors. So um, I've never actually used it for that reason because I, I know about that in advance. Um, but anyways, a similar one, very similar one is the MVAR. And I have used this in the past and then ultimately found out that I needed to use the TVAR. Uh, and so MVAR stands for mutable variable um, or short for mutable variable. And so um, I have a program here which works with the mutable variable. So I also have some, some ways to make this break. Oh, I'm learning but Python in my brain. Um, and so what I'm doing here, I, well, so, you know, what, what's, what's really the difference between a, a mutable variable and um, a file is not honestly that much. Both a file and a mutable variable can hold memory. Um, and so we could just, you know, continually read and write to a file, and that file is shared between processes. But we can run into issues where the threads block each other. Um, and I try to, you know, write to that um, file at the same time, but there's no logical outcome for two processes trying to write to the same file at the same time. Especially if you think about that you know, what they write to the file might be based on what was already in the file. Um, obvious example is append, you know, you're just adding something to the end. Um, or, you know, maybe, you know, you're, you're continually updating some JSON um, with with values, you know, you, you've attained from your program. Um, so, yeah. Um, but, you know, even still, uh, we can still have blocking with an MVAR. There is a bit of a difference in the fact that if an MVAR is in use at the current moment, it will wait a second to see if the MVAR is available, right? So we have this, this take MVAR, uh, which is very similar to read MVAR, right? So read MVAR doesn't actually block anything. Um, we could do this no problem, um, and it, you know, would not stop any other programs or any other threads from uh, accessing that, that mutable variable. And so I am jumping a little bit ahead in the terms of the code here because um, we need to start by initializing this MVAR. And so what I did is I, I took what was in the file path or text and it was actually this here. Uh, I was kind of messing around with it a second ago, but um, this is the, the, the text, textual contents of that file. We read that file, name it txt, and then initialize a new mvar with that uh, memory. Uh, and if we look at the type of new mvar, Try import control dot concurrent. We see that it takes some value a and gives us an M I O M bar a. So what does this mean in plain English? This means that we are giving it some typed value and um, creating a reference to that value. Right. So. Um, here, when we do this, this file contents is just our reference, uh, which allows, which is going to tell our program where to put the data that we want, um, you know, to put to our MBAR, right? It's just a, a reference to that uh, location, and then we f we feed um, that location with, with certain uh, data. Uh, for example, put MBAR. We can see down here if we jump ahead a bit, put mvar has that reference, and then it's going to put, um, it's going to take the original state and then add hey to it at the end. And um, yeah, so uh, right, so we have a reference and then we have our new value. 
And if we look at the type of put mvar, we see that it takes the reference, takes a new value of the same type, right? It keeps the same type, uh, and then that's an IO action. So, um, yeah. And then, let's see here. So, um, basically, we, so we have to do, um, there's also a couple things I should get to about setting up a, a concurrent program in terms of like the, you know, not direct stuff, um, that stuff that I could easily miss talking about. Um, and so I had to use, to add this GHC options of threaded RTS options, uh, to my executable stanza. Um, stanza, I don't know if it's called a stanza, uh, it's a block of stuff. And, um, yeah, so now this allows my program to be threaded, um, and has runtime system options, um, and so that's what, and, and so basically now this allows up to four threads to run at once, um, and we read the file contents, we do this, I don't need this anymore, let's actually get into this. Um, oh, and sorry, did I forget? Oh, yeah, and then set the number of capabilities. Is, those, those are the two real things that are not directly in the code. About, well, like not directly, you know, the business logic of what you want to do in your concurrency. Um, yeah, that, that's that's how to set it up. So, um, just going to delete or put those in comments for now. And so what I am doing here is I get, okay, sorry, I get the the text from the file. I create a new MVAR with that, that text. This gives me my reference. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use another function, fork IO. And so this is like the core, um, I didn't even notice that was there core piece of, or the most common function you'll use in concurrency, whether you're using mvars or tvars, you will most likely be using um, fork IO. I'm 99% sure of that. I can't think of a case where you wouldn't. And so if you look at the type of fork IO, it's of the type IO, and it returns a thread ID. So this actually, I could get back like thread IDs Here, if I really wanted to, but uh, and then I could also kill the processes by getting those by ha having access to those thread IDs, um, and but I don't really care about that for now. So um, and this might confuse you a little bit the fact that I have fork IO or fork IO takes uh, an IO action, um, but this is not necessarily an IO action. It's uh, well, it is because it all it is really is a IO action which takes parameters, right? So once this gets its mvar string, the type of it will be IO unit, and so it will work. And also, you, you'll notice that with it being an IO unit, uh, you know we can't return anything from the program. And this is for the same reason that you wouldn't return anything from main. Um, like where are you returning it to is really the question. Um, you know, if you want to give that memory back to the main thread, uh, well, then you would have to use mvars, io refs, or tvars. Um, that's the only way to communicate data between a fork pro between processes, uh, even if it's the the forking process. So let's try this. Um, so anyways, sorry, I, I, I also have this map M here. This is really just so that I can um, fork five of them. It's gonna take this integer five times, right? It's gonna do this five times uh, because that's the length of the list. And it's just gonna throw out the integer and then get going. Um, and that's this here, this other program. It takes my MVAR um, and it's gonna take the MVAR do a thread delay of 10,000, or sorry, 1 million, um, and then 
put the MVAR back. And so for this time, it's going to hold on to that MVAR so that no other system can use it, or so no other process can use it. And I'm just going to add another zero there just to really make sure this works. Okay. Um, I think this is, yep, perfect. <laughs> Love failure. So this is the this is the problem with MVAR, um, is we don't, like, we don't always know, uh, you know, we hardly ever know how long certain processes are gonna take. And so it's not like we can, you know, write nice clean code that says, like, okay, you should have to wait for between two to four seconds and make sure you wait between two to four seconds. Um, you know, th th this does wait for some amount of time, um, but it's even possible that, you know, there's multiple things trying to take this MVAR. And so, um, you know, even if, even if uh, it's very quick to run the process which uses your MVAR, right, all I'm really doing is, is nothing with it. I'm just literally doing a thread delay and then adding a string to it. Um, you know, and let's say I even take this out, right? I believe this should still, this this should actually, I believe, work. Uh, it, it, it'll, it'll kind of work, actually. And I bet you, hmm, no, it won't, okay. Because it doesn't have to wait long enough. And so I guess, like, if you, you know, if you have that kind of guarantee that it is going to be a very simple process, um, you know, it's only going to be, it, in use for a, a hot second, then yeah, I suppose you can get away with MVARs, but uh, there's a much better solution in Haskell. And, um, yeah. So, have I covered everything about MVARs? Um, I mean, so and here's what we're doing, right? We're, we're taking the MVAR, we had our, th our thread delay of uh, 10 million. And I don't know if that's actually 10 million, but, um, and then we put the M bar back. So we no longer are holding on to this, you know, have a death grip on the M bar. Other systems, or sorry, other processes can use the M bar. Um, and that's just so that we don't have any, you know, uh, any intermingled data, right? We wouldn't want to, let's say we had two types which have, you know, in, in for whatever reason we're showing, or you know, turning that into a string, right? We're using some uh, the show function to turn uh, a into a string, and then we write that string to the uh, mvar. We would see that um, it, it, we actually might just corrupt our data. Is the point because we we would do show twice, and then try and you know put two different things to the mvar, and it would fail. Um, however, with take mvar, nothing else can write to that mvar for the time that this program, or sorry, this process has the mvar. Um, yeah, but it, and that's what we want, right? We don't want in intermingling of data, um, so that's, that's not a bad thing. Uh, and we have other helper functions that really do the same thing. Uh, also, like, kind of try to help with this um, th this possibility for failure, and uh, we can even preemptively check if it's empty, and then to have some logic to deal with the fact that it's empty. However, that kind of just, in my opinion, becomes code bloat if we have to say what we're doing in response to this being empty. Um, it'd be nice if we just could assume that this variable is good to take, and if it's not we have a very, very uh, light way to deal with that consequence, which is just to simply wait. So that's where TVAR comes in. Um, so TVAR um, also comes very closely aligned with the STM monad. And so we, we can make a, a new TVAR in one of two ways. Um, so 
I actually use this in, in my programs currently, and I'll, I'll show an example of how I do that after I unpause this because I don't want to show anything un unintendedly. Alright, so um, this is kind of how I actually use TVARS uh, in my web scraping program. Um, and so you can think of a genre as just a search term. Um, and I have a, a bunch of uh, scrapers set up to work in a very particular way, which is encased in a process genre. So this is the, the kind of core piece here, right? Everything really revolves around setting this up so that we can um, run uh, 16 scrapers in parallel. And um, pretty crazy, but we, and and and, and uh, well, no, that's I'm not going to say that. That's unimportant. Um, but we have you know our get genre or get next genre, and our put genre back. And so you know these are like um, a list of search terms. I'm just going to say hey, hello. yellow um, and so obviously there's way more than that we have about 215 I believe and so um, I am using a currency for the motivation of um, managing or, or keeping balance between these search terms so uh, each search term um, and the way that the scraper is set up would take about um, <laughs> longer than the sun to um, to, to run L longer than by the time it would, it would complete the sun would have exploded so um, lots of because uh, there's, there's lots of, of data to get um, a lot of very um, you know, relevant results that could be found for that that search term and so that's not really a good uh, strategy is to wait until one of the 215 are done and then start in the next one and so I want to have this switch between all of them and so what this does is it is it takes a little chunk of work um, for the genre that it has and so everything in the program um, is kind of controlled by what genre is it has, and so each of these, each of the the processes, will take from this list of genres, right? Take from it. Um, it will need access to the tvar and update the tvar. It'll then take. I will then have the genre, right? So yellow will now just exist elsewhere outside of this tvar. And if you want to visualize it that way, I suppose. Um, and once I am done with it, once I have done enough scraping of that genre, I'm going to put the genre back. And so um, how do we actually do this? So for put next genre, or sorry, get next genre, um, I'm going to rewrite it and show you guys. So I have a, I would have a tvar of genre, um, oh, and it has importance as well, but that's not really relevant. We know we don't need to think about that here. Um, get that genre. So t tvar ref. Um, and so, what are we going to do here? Um, well, we need to get into a couple different concepts here. And it's actually quite simple once we understand the concepts. The concepts are what make it so simple. Um, so we have a, a function atomically, we have the STM monad, and then we have TVARs. Those are our three core concepts. And so we need all of them to make the software transactional memory model possible. Um, and so what, 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 first off, let, let's start with the atomically, uh, just because it's kind of the most uh, important piece here. Oh. So at uh, atomically takes something of the type STMA and makes it an IOA action. 
And so, um, well, then that, that brings us to what is STM? STM is the monad that supports atomic memory transactions. And so, you know, if you're familiar with databases, of course, um, uh, atomicity or, you know, whatever, uh, and I'm not, actually not sure if I'm using that, that word right. I'm not really a language person, um, but, you know, like, um, uh, what this is going to do all or none, right? It, it atomically just simply means do all of these actions or none of them at all, and then wait. Um, and, and so everything in terms of this monad is implicit. It, it, it implicitly going to be able to retry. Um, and so we can ex explicitly make it retry by doing um, retry here. Like we, we could, for example, say um, if, if we find some condition, then retry. Uh, if we find that, you know, the the TVAR is um, the actual contents of the TVAR are, are empty, then we're just going to retry. And this might retry after. And it, it's not. It's also just rescheduling the thread. So it may not retry. There's no guarantees about um, when it will retry. Uh, it will just kind of execute in terms of the queue. And so, um, hopefully, another variable, sorry, another process has come along and changed the, the contents of that TVAR so that it's no longer empty and we can retry successfully. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's atomically. And let, let's, let's show an example here. Um, and, and, and this also might become a little more clear if we look at, oh, perfect, um, this TVAR. Right, so read tvar, for example, is a is an action we can do in the STM monad. You cannot do well. I was gonna say you can't do it in the IO monad. Um, this is just basically like it's saying here, running atomically on the read tvar. Um, but let's kind of you know ignore that for now. Um, and so what I do with process genre. Um, well, so here's here's exactly how I write it, and I'll I'll, I'll explain it in a second. Um, read tvar tvar ref. So this will expose. Um, I'm gonna call this genres, right? And this will be literally of the type genre here um, I want to take the head of genres and so I actually can also just pattern match on this and say I'm always ex I'm, I'm always expecting it to be a non-empty list so although this is really kind of bad um, in terms of safety I don't really honestly care at this moment um, this will work and so I, I want to just get G and the next genre is actually going to be more like this. So I'm going to return G, but also before I do that, I have to um, put back the TVAR. So write TVAR. I'm going to write the TVAR by getting its reference. So my TVAR ref and the genres. So I'm putting back the genres with one last, one less genre uh, existing, and that's because I'm going to use it in my process. And so um, if I did not have this atomically here, right, that's exactly how I would write it. If I did not have my atomically here, this is STM genre. Um, but I want to call it in something like proc main where I am, I, I, it has to be IO. And so um, I can, I could do this by saying like, let's say get next genre was actually of the type STM genre that I would have to do atomically get genre in order to fit it to the IO monad. And so 
what this is saying is that atomically perform the entire uh, STM monad function that you STM monadic function um, that I that has been given um, and so let's say now right and I think I think that makes makes sense and that's that's well explained it might even look a little bit like too simple um, because I mean really that's all you need to think about in the terms of this monad is literally just like you know B T var right T var, um, the you know, it is a little different in the sense that you can't do lift I O like you couldn't say lift I O print because it's just it's actually not um, monad I O, um, so that's the first case I've ever really seen that, um, and yeah, like um, yeah, it, 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 right and so atomically is just the key point executing. All of that's contained in um, get next genre, and we can look at the type to say, right? It's just taking this and then converting it to an I/O action. Perform a, ser a series of I/O uh, SCM actions atomically. Um, yeah, and um, let's see here. So, and then I would put the genre back, which is really just, right, let's give a genre, or it takes the genre, takes the tvar reference, and it's going to be of the type stm nothing, or unit, put genre back, um, g, Cheese, and this is going to do so I have to read tvar tvar ref Oop. yeah I'm just going to call this tvar ref more confusing than anything the other way uh, this is what Jesus um, and now I'm going to write my t-bar and yeah let's pretend I would do it like that there, was, there I, I would do it differently but no point in overcomplicating um, and so write t-bar is of the type Unit so this fits, um, and then we'd have to call it like this. We'd say proc main equals do um, genre. We get our genre by atomically get next genre, we have access to our tvar. We'd run, right? I'm gonna say run genre, genre, does some scraping, and then we put the genre back. And put genre back will also need the T bar. And so now we have a concurrent T bar program. Uh, I can actually restart this now. Um, We'll see this go actually. And I'm only doing this out of pure laziness. I should really be calling Cabal Run, but um, yeah. Okay, so now this is going to ask me for. Um, how many processors I would like to use. I'm going to say 16. Actually, oh, um, I'm not going to say, I'm going to say 12 for now just because I'm not sure if the video quality is going to, uh, right. Uh, I'm going to say 12 for now just because I'm not sure if the video quality is going to deteriorate. 
Um, I put a little pause in here just so that whoever is actually running this will actually read this because uh, we're running this on multiple computers. And oh, how many processors would you like to use? Twelve. So now this is going. Um, uh, I'm being lazy. I'm not really working on my logs yet. So this is trying to print 16 different, sorry, 12 different processes are trying to print to the console. We can see there's a destroyed just here. Um, and then it's going to eventually start printing out in um, good form. Um, so yeah, you can see it just kind of pump. Cool. So, um, yeah. Now, I'm actually going to stop this for now. And, yeah. So, um, let's see if we can get this running. Or let's see if we can build a little quick, um, quick recreation of of this program. So, I'm just gonna actually. Uh, so instead of other program, I'm going to call the proc main, which is going to have our tvar. I'm going to use tvar IO um, because I'm in the IO monad and it's just more convenient. And this is going to, this should work actually. It's proc main. It's going to be of the type tvar genre. Um, TIO. If we. So we obviously set, we set our number of capabilities, the number of um, processes that can run at the same time to four. We don't need that anymore. That was for testing. And I am, so to make this actually fit the type of genre, which is just literally, I have a type um, genre is strings, sorry, string. So I'm going to convert this to a list of strings by doing words. Um, it just converts like a, you know, words would take uh, a sentence and convert it into, um, you know, break on the spaces basically. <clears throat> and so now we have a valid um, thing here. We need to import STM. Add the language extension here. Uh, I'm just using this so I can be very clear to you guys on what is coming out of this read tvar, just so it's a little less confusing and less ambiguous to read. To tvar. Oh yes, this is actually file contents. I'm gonna recall this genre, genres. Also need. Control that concurrent, which I just got rid of, out of laziness. Just run genre. And we're just going to say run genre is just going to take a genre and it's going to print it. And then it's complaining because I'm saying that I return 
a unit, so I need to put this here because otherwise um, it will return a list of thread IDs, which I could also do actually by just using mapm um, underscore, which t throws out the variable anyways, and therefore is of the type IO unit. Um, my T bar. Oh, and I just forgot to pass it the reference. It doesn't know where to write it. So I'll write tvar to this place with this value. And now, this is complaining because it's saying, okay, you're trying to do put genre back, which is an STM action in an IO monad. And so we'd have to say atomically, I did it up here already. Did it for one, not the other. But you see what... Um... Oh, you know what? That actually makes sense. Okay. Um... Okay, well, I'm going to do it a different bad way. Um... Genres. We're going to pure the head of genres. Uh, which is safe in this context because I know it's not going to be empty. I have 226 of them um, or whatever. And then I'm going to put back the tail of genres. So I'm just going to put take the first of the list and then put the rest back. And now this compiles. So um, this is going to print to our console what genre it would be working on instead of actually doing anything with it, right? In, in, in reality, we would be doing more with it instead of just printing. Um, but it doesn't really matter how complicated the process is in terms of how we would deal with memory, um, you know, in, in, in that process using certain memory, which must be shared in a concurrent context. So now, if I say... Hold on one second. Never mind. I am just a fool. So um, I'm going to use something here forever. This has failed me before. And this should just continue to retry it. There we go. OK. So not, uh, I mean, we're writing to the same place at the same time. So we can't really expect this to be perfect. But it is writing. Um, the words that it found in this file, right? There's there's four different processes grabbing from these this shared word list, right? And we can I'm gonna have to kill this. Um, how can we do this a little bit? Well, we could see. I'm gonna print words. TXT, lazy way of doing it, and then I'm also going to use a thread delay just so we can see it quick. I think that should be enough. It's in microseconds. Um, and it's going to continually, continually um, iterate between these words. I don't know how long I put it for. Oh, there we go. Okay. And now it's just continually grabbing them, um, writing to the console, and then putting it back. Right? And so we can actually kind of see a proof of that. I don't know if you, how fast you guys can read. <laughs> but uh, uh, it kind of looks like there's some repetition. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you kind of zone out a bit and squint. So, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's really all there is to say about concurrency directly in Haskell is, is use STM. Um, again, this is a, definitely a summary of all things concurrency in Haskell. And, and not, not, uh, this is not going to be the best resource. This is not trying to be the best resource on, on concurrency in Haskell because that goes to beautiful concurrency in Haskell. You can see an actual 
uh, example of like a, I think it was like Santa's reindeer or something like that, you know. But um, th this is largely what we are doing. We have we have variables in memory, and we are just passing. We're, we're interacting with that variable, right? You know, we, we want to, for example, like in a um, sequential program or you know loan program, right? We are not. Uh, sorry, we are just gonna pull the next genre and then work on it, and then we're gonna be done with that genre. And then we're gonna, you know, pull the next genre and continue to pull the next genre, can pull the next genre. But now we have a bunch of, of processes doing that, and so we're just building it. it we're just using um, atomically to share this this memory, right? And and, and and atomically is really nice. Atomically and STM is a really nice um, model because it allows us to be well. A it allows us a monadic interface. And just a lot of flexibility in terms of what we want to do, um, and it, it, the the model, or sorry, the the monad itself is limited in, in that you can't do lift IO in it. Um, but really, all you want to do with this, you know, with this monad, is um, you know edit some variables. And so you know you, even too like another another thing we could do is let's say like. For whatever reason, um, you know, like this is kind of for the sake of letting your imagination run wild, or, or, or showing that there is no real constraints here in terms of what we're uh, capable of doing. Is I could have another T bar here of um, imp. I, I don't know. Uh, T bar of int. I don't know. I have no idea what these ints represent. Um, you know what? We're just gonna say this is a random list of ints. Uh, from zero to ten, about uh, how much to do, or how much, um, like how, how many how many scrapes to do, how many um, scraping actions to do. So and here we do um, t bar int. I could say oh, ints is read t bar var int and you know um, I could maybe even just move data from ints to genres now obviously I'd have to convert the type so I would just say um, write tvar tails to genres you know and now I'm gonna also put in um, show of of ints um, if I really wanted to, for some reason, I'm not I'm not sure why I'd want to do this, right? But, but this monad allows us to interact with some number of of T bars is the point, and return to our program a piece of memory, right? And so that that piece of memory is just safely um, attained. And that's the real point. There's not really much more to say about it. Obviously, a lot of people talk, like like to talk a lot about concurrency. I don't think it's any more complicated than that. Um, yeah. So, oh, and then I guess the last point to say is there's thread delay. You can use thread delay in any context, but um, you also might, you know, maybe want it in um, the concurrent concept, context. Uh, I believe there's even a sleep function, but, you know, um, it'd be better to do thread delay than sleep. So, um, yeah, that, that, and that's, that's all there is, um, besides the set number of capabilities and editing your cabal file to have the, um, the flag for concurrency, um, which I'll just show again right here. So, um, that's it. I, I, I again, I hope you enjoyed. Um, as always, please feel free to leave comments and a critique. Um, I would really love that. Um, and uh, if not, uh, we'll have a good day. And if, if so, have a good day. Um, but I hope you enjoyed and uh, look forward for my next video. I'm gonna start looking into more, um, you know, language sort of libraries and, and frameworks that are helpful for web development. Um, so, bon voyage.